Hi, I'm Karen Elliott, and you're listening to the District B-Sides Podcast, where you'll hear in-depth conversations with council, staff, and community members to take you behind the decisions that are being made on topics that matter to Squamish. Now let's tune in and join the conversation. My name is Natasha Golbeck. I'm the Senior Director of Community Services for the District of Squamish, and I'll be the host of District B-Sides for today. The current tension between off-leash and on-leash advocates in Squamish has led to some very intense conversations in our community. We're exploring ways to better align our animal control bylaw with the interests of our community by proposing changes that will allow dogs to be off-leash in clearly identified areas. How can we create safety, harmony, and balance for all of our residents? Council's faced with this very delicate challenge of balancing competing community interests. On the one hand, Many dog owners advocate for their dogs to have off-leash opportunities to explore their natural environment, to get better exercise, and to socialize with other dogs. On the other hand, off-leash activity is very challenging to enforce, and it allows for conflict with wildlife, vulnerable people and children, or those fearful of dogs. And of course, some dogs behave badly, despite insistence of their owners that they've never done that before. In this episode, we'll explore both ends of the leash debate, as well as potential policy options. We'll hear from dog trainer and expert Marin Brun, from the district's bylaw supervisor Chris Baker, from our Squamish mayor Karen Elliott and councillor Doug Race, and we'll get a historical perspective on animal control from councillor Eric Anderson. Let's get to the conversation. We're talking to Marin Brun, professional certified dog trainer and dog behavioral consultant. Marin co-founded Our Dog Society in 2015 with colleague Joanna Schwartz after a number of conflicts in the community between dogs, humans, cyclists, and wildlife. We're going to get Marin's perspective on these very complicated issues. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. How does exercise factor in to dogs' behavior? Oh, Squamish is famous for that, right? Exercise. We all need our exercise. Everything's better when we've had our exercise, um, as long as we're not overstimulated and overstressed. But yeah, we just are meeting our physiological needs um, for activity, and our body is just better balanced when we've had some good exercise. And you find that to be true for dogs as well as humans. <laughs> oh, which one were <laughs> we talking about? I know it's true for me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Why do dogs need off-leash areas to exercise? Why isn't just walking them on a leash down a trail going to be sufficient? Yeah, uh, walking on a leash, it's great. It's part of their world. We want to teach them how to walk politely on a leash, but it is rarely exercise for any dog, even a small dog. We want changes of gates. We want uh, yeah, to intersperse it with play and investigating. Um, so we need places where they can yeah, have different types of movement. And would a fenced dog park meet that objective? Sure. For some dogs, dog parks will be a great outlet. They can just go somewhere and they can get their, again, get their zoomies out uh, without affecting other people in the community. Um, Or maybe they can go to the dog park when no one else is around. Their dog isn't quite trained to come when called yet. But at least that way they can go release some energy before they go for a leash walk. And then then everyone's not as frustrated when they are on leash. Um, or a couple of dog play buddies that just want to have somewhere safe where they can zoom. Um, yeah, so it can meet some dog's needs. And then there's some other aspects of that, right? The, the dog's needs that maybe shouldn't be at the dog park. So say more about that. What, give, give us an example. Yeah, um, I guess as someone that has a fine eye for dog's body language and what they're, yeah, dog's body, what they're doing, what they're saying, what behavior they're going to do next. I observe dogs all the time, and at a dog park, often you see the extremes. A dog that's extra scared, maybe maybe being targeted, picked on, or a dog that's too rambunctious, too bullyish, and, um, yeah, is not really playing the right games. So there's, that's not going to be good for either one of those dogs. So who is not a good candidate to be off-leash? In the proposed model of off-leash areas, who would not be a good candidate to use those areas? The proposed areas, I think you mentioned, were 
off-leash areas without fencing, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So we'd need some good verbal recall on our dog just to, for if somebody goes nearby in the distance on a bicycle or, uh, yeah, just some other nearby dogs or people or wildlife that uh, you don't want them to be impacted by your dog's behavior. So you want, you want to have a recall on your dog. Do most dogs recall fairly reliably? It is, a, it is definitely a skill that takes a lot of practice. Not reliably. No, let's face it. Even my own dogs. I've got pretty good recall on all three of my dogs. But it's, it's behavior, so there's always a lot of variability. One of the things that we talked about in the community engagement with this proposed change was that one of the factors of uh, or the, one of the criteria that would need to be met is that dogs would have to be able to be recalled. And so that would be one of the things that bylaw officers would test in the area to ensure compliance with the restrictions was that a dog would recall. And lots of community members pushed back pretty hard on that. And they said, you know, I have a really good dog, but dogs are distractible. And if they're chasing something, a squirrel or whatever, and you recall them, they're not going to come to you, even if most of the time they would. So is, how do we, how do we ensure that a dog is a good candidate for an off-leash area if recall is always going to be variable? I think the layout of that off-leash area might be helpful. Is it far away enough from the dike where maybe the children, the bikes, the other families are passing by uh, so that other users can avoid that area if the dog doesn't recall perfectly and that one time they do kind of not listen, at least they're not going to endanger, well, not even impact other people one of the things that we've heard a lot is that the change in densification in Squamish and different housing forms like condos has really changed the kinds of issues we see with dogs and responsible dog ownership. What do you recommend to people who have dogs and live in condos or the denser areas of Squamish? Can I say it? Yes. It depends. It depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for some dogs, it's not as difficult for sure. But let's say you have a dog that's, oh, yeah, having some issues they have to work on. You might actually want to drive your dog to a quieter part of town, then walk it there so it can start to come down to baseline and just, you know, be able to relax and breathe so you can concentrate on some training and relationship building engaging exercises. One of the things that we've heard a lot from our community, particularly in the community engagement, is that we don't have in Squamish a shared sense of community expectations for standards of responsible dog ownership. How do you think we can get there? Find ways to make it easy to do the right thing. So, oh, okay, I don't mind putting my dog on leash this one block if I know there's a perfect off-leash area up ahead. Or, <laughs> sure, I'll pick up my dog poop, dog's poop. No problem, I've got a bag. Picking it up is easy. Oh, but I don't want to carry it. Oh, I know there's another garbage can. Yay. So how can we make it easy to do the right thing? On a multi-use trail, should they be allowed to be off-leash, even if they're nice dogs? Um, I think on a multi-use trail, the dogs are kind of... The one, to, for, for other trail users, it's like whether it's another bike, kids, people, horses, I think the dogs have to be moved to the side for all other trail users. So you see anybody, your dog should avoid them unless specifically given permission to go say hi or invited. What advice do you have for people who are entering the off-leash dog area to optimize the safety and enjoyment of the space for everybody. All right, like before you unclasp that leash and say, be free, um, I guess you really do want to know your dog, know that you at least have a, a relationship where they will respond to you with whatever cues you have trained them to do. And yeah, be honest with yourself. What is the likelihood of them responding. So definitely want that. And then often just setting the stage right from the get-go before you let them off a leash. Are they going to respond to you even when they are on leash? 
hmm, that's challenging. Maybe they shouldn't be off leash. So set the stage. And then while they are off leash, engage with them. Don't just let it be the dog runs the whole time you're in the off leash area. Stop, play with them, share sniffing on a bush. Uh, you know, run with them for a few feet, then engage them with some kind of little trick. And just kind of like that back and forth of we're in this together. We're partners. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. We're so fortunate in Squamish to have a community of dog experts who give us advice so that we can try to come up with the best policy options to meet this challenge. Thank you for having me. Um, We are fortunate Squamish is known as a dog-friendly community. Uh, But we want to make sure it's friendly for everyone else as well. We're talking to Chris Baker, the District Supervisor of Bylaw and Animal Control. Let's say I have a dog that I like to walk off-leash in my neighborhood. Am I allowed to do that? Not currently, no. That would be a violation in the the current state of the bylaw. Uh, Requires that dogs be leashed whenever they're off of their owner's properties. And are you able to enforce that? We're able to enforce it. We can write tickets. The limiting factor is the the number of bylaw officers that we have and the size of the district it makes it quite challenging for bylaw officers to, to make a, an impact. We say in bylaw quite often that our primary goal is voluntary compliance. What are the factors that would make somebody comply voluntarily with a bylaw? I think having that bylaw makes sense to them. Or for a bylaw officer to be able to easily explain that that bylaw to them when a bylaw officer asks someone to uh, leash their dog and they comply and follow up with the question, well, where can I walk my dog off leash? Um, I think that you know, not having an answer to that question kind of leads people to the conclusion that the bylaw doesn't make a lot of sense. How much of your time is taken up with off-leash dog complaints as a bylaw team? I'm not sure right now of the exact percentage of, um, of the calls. It is a large number. Also, the, the emotion behind those calls, there's, a, there's definitely a lot of frustration. And I think that that is a reason why this, this has, has become a focus in, in an area that we want to, uh, to make some changes. Why do you think this is such a hot issue for people? I think people have an emotional connection to their to their pets and they don't want to be told how to negotiate the world with their animals. And then I think there's there's another side where um there's there are people that have that have a fear of of animals whether that fear is that they themselves would be injured by a by an animal or have a fear that their children might be injured by an animal. And I think reconciling those two groups of people is difficult. It's, it's very difficult. And that's why this project aims to separate those, those two groups in space. So what we're looking to do is disperse areas that will be uh, located um, close to, to each neighborhood where dogs can be off leash. These areas will be clearly marked, so people will, will be made aware using signage when they're entering these, these uh, areas and what the expectations are. And this will allow for space that dogs can be off leash. What if I'm in a trail and my dog is like a really, really good dog? Everybody's dog is a really, really good dog. Um, but. I mean, one of the things to consider there is if your dog is in an area where it's meant to be leashed and somehow causes, say, a person, a cyclist to have an accident, then you're going to be liable for that, uh, that person's uh, injuries. With moving towards a model where we have areas that are clear to everybody that that's going to be the expectation, then it, it alerts anybody who's going to be using that area that there might be dogs off leash and then allows them to make decisions to keep themselves safe and that ends up making the the dog safer and, and everybody safer. One of the reasons people obey the rules is because they feel like they might be being watched. Somebody might keep their dog on a leash because they think, oh, there might be an animal control officer just around the corner. When the size of our team is small relative to the area of Squamish, 
we can't really make a dent in voluntary compliance through proactive patrols alone. How will this be different in the new model? The big change with moving towards this model is that we can better direct those proactive patrols to have a bigger impact. So proactive patrols within these these areas to uh, to make sure that the conditions um, of using these areas are are being met uh, will be much more effective because the the areas are are, are so much they're, they're smaller and and they're well defined. How sure are you that this is going to work? I mean, I can be fairly confident because of the the feedback that we've we've uh, received. We've spent a lot of time talking to different stakeholders, different people about this issue. I think we also have other communities to look to. Um, we're not reinventing the wheel with this this decision. Um, there are other communities in the Lower Mainland uh, and and further afield where models very similar to this uh, are working. In the current state, there are a lot of people that are just making their own decisions. And I think given the opportunity to understand and get on board with this system, I think a lot of people are going to find that it, that it makes a lot of sense, that it allows for them to recreate with their animals as they want to, and as they probably currently are, but in wherever they determine is, is safe enough. And I think once we get a large proportion of the community uh, using these areas as, as uh, is intended, it will end up improving safety and hopefully reducing conflict and frustration within the community. What could go wrong in moving forward with this proposed plan? The one problem that we could have is that, or the biggest problem that we could have is that people don't don't adopt this new system. It will only work uh, if people decide that it makes sense to them and that they are willing to to use these areas in, in the way that we've outlined. That's why we've made efforts to seek feedback from the community and, uh, and make sure that the direction that we're going is supported by people in the community. If the district moves forward with implementing this change, what are the concerns we're going to watch for? How will we know if it's been successful? Hopefully we'll see a reduction in the number of complaints that, that we're receiving about off-leash dogs. And hopefully we'll also uh, notice a, a reduction in the, the frustration level of the, of the people making those, those complaints should they, should they arise. If I am a person who currently walks my dog off-leash whenever I want... Kamloops is nice this time of year. Kamloops is nice this time of year. <laughs> What's in it for me with this change? You would have a space where you know you can go and you know nobody's going to bother you. You're, you're not going to worry about getting a ticket from a bylaw officer. Uh, you, you'll know that your decision to go to this area will be in line with the expectations of the community, that you're making a safe choice for your dog and, uh, and a safe choice for the community. Hello, this is Councillor Eric Anderson. Let's take a look back at animal control bylaws and Squamish efforts to be a dog-friendly community. This has been discussed a long time. It began with cattle and horses in the downtown. According to a 1949 newspaper editorial, cows and horses wandering about the streets are an aggravating nuisance to car drivers and pedestrians alike. The animals cannot be expected to keep themselves off the streets and sidewalks, so action should be taken to correct the situation. A year later, in 1950, downtown Squamish is described by a local experienced cowboy as having a good start for a cattle ranch. It is wonderful, he wrote, to see them in the evenings resting on the sidewalks after a long, hard day of being driven by the village dogs and harassed by the little boys. Back in the 1920s, Cleveland Avenue department store owner Rod McKenzie would get up at night and open his bedroom window above the street to yell at the animals and Dave Galbraith, who should keep his damn animals at home. Dave Galbraith was a rival storekeeper in the valley and a prominent liberal. Mackenzie was a conservative. So, animals, cattle, horses, and packs of dogs roaming at will over the streets of Squamish and disturbing the sleep of its residents was a long-standing concern. Finally, in 1961, a village pound law was passed. However, it would take a, quite a while 
to sort out how to implement and enforce it. The background to new bylaw initiatives was that Squamish was a rapidly growing community in the early 60s, with new park and campground amenities now connected to the city by a new highway. The expectations and habits of many visitors with respect to off-leash dogs were something new. There were incidents generating lots of discussion. In 1962, the Chamber of Commerce sent a delegation to Council to ask the Village Council to take action on off-leash dogs. The Dentville neighborhood and the geese on Mr. Bailey's small farm across from the high school were being terrorized by badly behaved dogs. During 1963, Village Council made arrangements with the West Vancouver Council and SBCA branch for periodic pound keeper patrols in Squamish for a trial period. But after the expansion to Valley Cliff and the 1964 amalgamation with Brackendale and Mamquam, the issues and complaints would soon outgrow Council's trial solution. New young families in Valley Cliff began a campaign for action on off-leash dogs. They were joined by delegations from Dentville and Garibaldi Estates. They complained that as soon as the SPCA truck comes through Britannia, people here are warned and all the dogs disappear. The dog catcher should come in an unmarked vehicle so people could not be warned in advance. More local control of dogs was being urged. In 1971, Dr. Steinhoff, then based in West Vancouver, established the first part-time vet clinic here. Dr. Hoff was to be a much-valued advisor to the district council in the years to come. A local dog catcher was also hired, but the experiment proved a failure after he was called at all hours during the night by people complaining about having their animals picked up. One of those evening callers was the local magistrate, whose dog could not resist biting the ankles of each of the four neighborhood newspaper boys cycling by, generating several complaints and dog catcher visits. At this time, 45 complaints per month on average was being received, and yet horses and cattle were still roaming about. In 1974, the West Vancouver SPCA called on Squamish Council. Their animal shelter was full. Squamish was now on its own, needing to find its own solutions. Dr. Steinhoff came forward with a dog pound design, and bylaw enforcement officer Tony Biggenpound delivered a durable set of recommendations on pound maintenance and bylaw enforcement programs, persisting to this day. In recent years, wildlife interactions and impacts have come more into focus, also in nearby parks and protected areas managed by the province. New off-leash dog parts are now the district's next initiative. To quote a 2018 newspaper letter, Squamish has rapidly growing city-type problems as well as human-wildlife interface problems. Squamish isn't the idyllic rural community some people imagine. Like it or not, change is a mixed bag. Keeping Squamish dog-friendly means changing both habits and expectations. So, for dogs or cattle or horses or humans, whether a liberal or a conservative, old-timers set in their ways or a visitor unaware, whether a city refugee or a new young family or the local magistrate. The pound law is for all of us and for all of us to continue to adapt to as Squamish grows. Well, who are we talking to? Hi, I'm Karen Elliott. I'm the mayor of Squamish. And I'm Doug Race. I'm one of the councillors. So Karen and Doug, let's hear a little bit about your experience with dogs. Do you have dogs yourself? I do have a dog. Um, he's two years old. He's a miniature schnauzer. Uh, but I thought I would get a dog quite a while ago um, when my kids were young. So I would say that I generally had positive experiences on the trails before I had kids. But then I realized once I had kids that those friendly dogs <coughs> that, that run up actually are really frightening to toddlers. And so we had to delay getting a dog for a long time because my, my kids were actually afraid of dogs because so many friendly dogs had run up to them or jumped on them and meant them no harm. But when you're, you know, up to someone's mid leg, that's a really intimidating thing to happen. So um, I felt really bad for them. I always thought a dog would be part of, of their lives in, from a much earlier age. So. It's such a great point because often the discourse about this issue is that some dogs are bad dogs or mean dogs are going to be aggressive. And that does happen sometimes. But most dogs are friendly and social yeah. and they just want to say hello. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a harmless encounter depending on who's on the other end of it. How about you, Doug? Do you have dogs? 
Uh, <clears throat> no, I don't have a dog. Um, I've looked after a friend's dog, but, uh, but my experience with dogs has been uh, a little bit mixed over the years. And, and actually, it's interesting with Karen's comment because it, I can have a distinct memory when I was six years old of being uh, jumped by a big dog. And I can still see uh, the owners standing on the porch laughing, <clears throat> thinking this was all in great fun. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, for me, I was terrified. And, uh, and then finally, somebody came and pulled the dog off. But, but that terror actually lived with me throughout uh, my teenage years. And it wasn't until I think my early 20s when my brother came home one day to everybody's surprise with an eight-week-old German Shepherd puppy. Uh, and so we were all living in the same house. And I got to see that dog growing up and, and became more comfortable with a big dog. And, and that was a good thing because uh, it was about the same time that I started running. And over the decades, running on roads and trails and so forth, I've lost count of the number of times that I've had encounters with aggressive dogs and, and some of them attacking you, some of them thinking they're playing and others. Uh, but um, it's been a mixed experience in that sense. And now, um, occasionally, I babysit my friend's dog. I understand how people can get attached to the little things. They are kind of a delight. Uh, but. Um, but we keep it on a leash and, and try to not have it go after people, particularly toddlers. And I think, you know, for me, it's uh, a lot of dog owners uh, that I've encountered that have had their dogs running make some comment about, oh, it's just playing or something like that. And I can tell you as a six-year-old, uh, that didn't go very far with me as a little kid. Uh, and even as an adult, uh, I try to keep my cool, but uh, so we've had the odd uh, verbal encounter over the years uh, with people that just don't properly look after their dogs and, and don't sort of think of others actually when they're out walking their dogs. I hope everybody heard the take home message in Doug's comment just now that you should bring home a puppy as a surprise for your family. <laughs> 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 that was what I heard. What do you think people in Squamish want from a bylaw on this issue? What's going to make people comply, and what do you think is the right role for bylaw enforcement here? Well, I think that's a big question, and I think that's one of the reasons um, we wanted to go back out to the public. So when I was sitting as a councillor last term, we went down this road of sort of thinking that we should build, like, dog parks, put up fencing, and, and designate very specific areas. And then we got a whole bunch of feedback about why that would be a bad idea. And then our staff gave us the tally of what that might cost us. And that made us think twice about, wait a second, is this the best use of tax dollars uh, for something that may not work? So, you know, I think, one, I think dog owners want freedom for their dogs. And I think they do want to be able to exercise them off leash. Um, I think, two, a lot of people in our community would like to see um, that they're not harassed by off-leash dogs. So be given the choice about whether they're going to encounter off-leash dogs or not. And so I think where we're getting to is a more common sense approach to off-leash dog bylaws and, and how you would enforce that. And, and I'm hopeful that that's where our community is at as well, is that we're going to take a more common sense approach to this rather than trying um, a purely enforcement approach because what we were doing wasn't working. And what do you think, Doug, as a, as a many-term serving counselor, how have you seen this issue evolve? What do you think people want now? Well, I think um, when I think of this issue, this is one of those issues where I don't think we're ever going to be able to craft anything that is, uh, appeals to everybody. And so from my perspective, I think we kind of have to look at the largest common denominator um, and I think that means we need leash laws, absolutely. Partly because, I guess, of my personal experience, uh, but also because, you know, when you, th when you think of how our community comes together, you know, we have chosen to live in close proximity to each other. Uh, this isn't the wild open range, uh, and that comes with constraints. And we have constraints around noise, for example, and, and other things, and parking, so to help us live together, and I think people looking after the animals they bring into these neighborhoods is part of that. And so we have to ensure that those animals are looked after because there are a lot of vulnerable people in our community. Uh, children, 
people who are a little frail, uh, who could really be hurt by, uh, by dogs inadvertently uh, without the dog owner sometimes really realizing it. I doubt the dog owner in my instance understood the effect that that encounter would have on me and my life and, and there are lots of people out there. I've, I've had dogs jump up on me and tear the clothing that I was wearing, the tracksuit and so forth and, and I don't think some owners really get it. So I think we do need to have that standard and, and, and I say that uh, because at the times I've looked after my friend's dog and sometimes it's been for extended periods, I love walking the dog. Uh, I love to get to an area where we can let the dog off the leash uh, and, and just watch them run. And they will <clears throat> get more exercise, of course, than any time that they're attached to a human. Uh, and it is kind of neat to watch them run and just to have that kind of freedom. But, but that, to me, is not in the middle of our neighborhoods. Uh, that just doesn't work. What do you think is the role of bylaw enforcement here? Well, I, I think a large part of it uh, is education. And, and we take that sort of position, I think, generally at the district. We first try education in a whole variety of different fields. And I think it's the same thing. You know, to talk to people, let them know that uh, probably nobody else in the world loves your dog like you do. So you just have to assume that the person that the dog is jumping on may not be as receptive as you might be. And so I think uh, education is a huge component of this. And ultimately, um, it may be a fine that finally does it for somebody. Some people just don't get education. One of the key challenges we have in creating policy around complicated issues like this is balancing competing priorities between user groups. What is your approach to this challenge as an elected official? How do you know that you got it right? <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, in some cases you get reelected. Yeah, <laughs> reelection. You got a good answer for that question, Doug? You can't make everyone happy, but I would like to see. I think I know when a bylaw has been successful is when um, it is addressing some of some of the concerns that have been raised, and when our staff actually have a good <laughs> chance of, uh, if they need to move past education, actually enforcing. Like to say that. You can't take a dog off leash anywhere in the district. How would we ever enforce that? And I think when you create the expectation that you might enforce it and can't, that actually creates more problems than when you create a more common sense bylaw and then show the community that you actually have the ability to enforce it. And that has, a, I think, a, a more positive impact than just trying to do a blanket no off leash dogs, which clearly doesn't work for our community. Um, and clearly cannot be enforced either. What do you think, Doug? Well, I think in some cases, um, as Karen said, I think in some cases it's the response from the public. Um, we may see fewer complaints, for example. Uh, we may have positive feedback um, from different people in different organizations. Um, sometimes the number of tickets that have to be issued goes down. Things like that, I think, would, uh, would go a long way. Sometimes as a counselor, you make decisions and, and you think they're right uh, and they have to be made. And at that particular moment, uh, you might not have a majority of the people in the community on side with you, but you still are convinced it's the way to go and you just have to make the decision. And, and sometimes the community will come around to that. So I, it, it would be a number of different things. But in this case with dogs, and you know, it would be the number of encounters, bad encounters, would hopefully go down, uh, and also the number of complaints. And I think that's important to remember. Like, some of our, our citizens have been harmed, seriously harmed, by an off-leash dog. And we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so there's got to be some rules around what kinds of dogs should be off-leash, even in those off leash areas. I mean, if you've got an aggressive dog, I don't think your dog is a great candidate for even our off-leash areas. So it's sort of coming to terms with the dog that you own um, and its ability to get along in the community in designated, designated off-leash areas. And the district providing some guidance around that for people about how to assess whether or not their dog is a suitable candidate. Because I think we all have different expectations about what a suitable candidate for an off-leash area would be, to your point earlier about friendly dogs jumping up on people. Mm -hmm. 
what if I live next to one of the proposed off-leash areas and I have a child who is terrified of dogs? What's in it for me? That's an issue. Um, in your situation that, that you describe, um, if that's a designated off-leash area, then I guess I would just have to say I would take my child somewhere else and, um, and not go there. I think if that's the way we went and we said a certain part of our community or bordering our community is, is primarily for off-leash dogs, uh, then that's the way it is. I think we've done similar things in the controversy when I was first on council in my first term. Uh, the issue was between mountain bikes and motorbikes. Uh, and more or less everybody agreed, okay, one will go in one place and one will go in the other place. And there's only a couple of places where they can both coexist on certain trails. And maybe it's the same thing. That clarity of expectation so that people can self-manage. I think so, yeah. Well, and I think this is going back to Doug's comment about education. So right now, the chances are is that in that area, probably 90% of dog walkers aren't keeping their dog on a leash. Um, and so there's, there's no education about, you know, the behavior of those dogs and what can be expected of them. Um, right now everyone just expects a dog to be on a leash. Um, so I think, you know, while it might be inconvenient that this goes in next to your home, if your child is afraid of dogs, at least if you choose to be in that area, you have a sense of what's expected of those dog owners, which you don't have right now. And two, then you can make a choice about where to go. And if your rights aren't respected about only seeing dogs on a leash where you choose to take your child, then you actually have the ability to say, hey, this is actually an on-leash area. There's another one close by. And so I think, you know, as a community, we're going to have to think about signage. How do we make this, you know, known? We have a lot of visitors who come from out of town in the summer. Um, so how do they know where they can run their dogs? And I think creating that sense of broad community expectation of, as Doug says, separating uses. I want to walk quietly and not be harassed by a dog that's off leash. Well, there should be places in our community to make that happen. And alternatively, hey, I want to let my dog run free and meet other dogs. Great. You know, we've got that for you, too. Without being concerned that somebody's going to shame you for taking your dog off leash. That's right. I mean, I'm trying to get my dog ready to be off leash. We walk him on leash, but that's like, you know, I'm the mayor, so I can't really take my dog off a leash. So we do it very early in the morning or when there's no one around. And as soon as we see people, we put them back on a leash. But I, I want to make sure that when we do have off leash areas, he's ready and is trained and he's got really good recall and, and you know stays when I want him to stay and comes back when I call him um, so that's a bit of a challenge right now because currently you have no lawful opportunities to take him off leash and get him practicing that correct so we talked a little bit about um, the previous proposal to have fenced off leash areas and what were the challenges associated with that you both served on council last term when this came forward and we had some discussion about what would be appropriate areas and the size and the um, strength of, and height of the fences in order to keep wildlife out of the off-leash areas and it ended up being quite expensive. Can you talk a little bit more about the considerations that came up during those conversations about deciding to switch gears to this model that we're currently bringing forward? Cost was certainly a factor. When staff came back to us and told us about the fencing costs alone for some of these uh, areas we were thinking about, uh, it almost immediately became prohibitive. And I mean, to make it work, you'd have to think you'd need a fairly large area, otherwise the dog is just kind of running around in circles. Um, and it would have to be something you could fence off because you don't want the dogs leaving that area. If it's in an urban setting, if it's downtown or in one of the neighborhoods, uh, then you do have to have that control. And so partly it was just how many pieces of real estate there are available that might fit the description uh, and the cost of those. Uh, you can't just put it anywhere. The oceanfront has always been thought of as a great place for an off-leash dog. That's a very expensive piece of real estate. Uh, and to take out a big piece of that from development and dedicate it, uh, I don't think that's ever going to happen. So I think we're looking at some of the fringes uh, of the community and um, 
possibly getting crown land or even just an area that we just designate uh, and advertise as, uh, as being that. But, but we wouldn't fence it. I mean, that would just almost immediately make it prohibitive. So I think we're faced with something like an unfenced area that we're going to rely on dog owners uh, to police themselves and their dogs uh, and just advertise that and make that part known. But it was cost and, and just the value of real estate, I think, that really stopped the previous discussions. I, I think for me, reflecting back on last term and our discussions, cost and, and where you would put them, but almost universally, um, our dog training community spoke up and went, oh, this is not really going to work for dogs and, and looking at dog behavior and actually confining a whole bunch of dogs into one space is not necessarily a recipe for success. Um, and plus, because we were concerned about the potential wildlife conflicts, we were considering an area up on the fan and lots of coyotes, like the fence actually needed to be quite robust. Um, so I think too, when, when you start to hear a general consensus feedback from the community that like, look, this isn't really going to work. And when I want to go and walk my dog, I don't want to go and stand in a fenced area. I actually go, I want to go walk a trail and, or walk along the dike and watch my dog run and, and throw a ball for him. And so we also have to like, think about who lives here. It's people that love the outdoors. So they don't want to walk their dog off leash inside a fence. They want to go and use a trail or use the dike system. So um, I think that sort of consistent feedback was like, this was not going to be money well spent. We would spend large amounts of money and those parks would probably be empty uh, for most of the time or perhaps just useful to small dogs. And we'd also, you know, we heard from the dog behavioral people that you would need to put entertainment in there. So like things for them to climb on, things things for them to do. It couldn't just be like this field of, of space. So it was kind of, an easy way to switch directions. When you hear that sort of consistent feedback, you know you're on the wrong track and it's time to sort of pivot in a new direction. And can you talk a little bit about wildlife conflict? Yeah, that is an issue. You have to think about that and when you're thinking about an area, you know, is this an area that is very sensitive? Uh, something like the estuary, for example, would not be considered, I wouldn't think. Dog owners are just going to have to realize that some places in our district are really off limits to dogs. We have some really environmentally sensitive areas that people just have to learn. It's it's not okay for your dog to run around um, because of its disturbance to habitat and wildlife. Anything else about any of these issues? Feedback helps us make our bylaws better. So as we move forward with this, that's the key, is don't be afraid to give us your feedback, positive or negative. Um, they're, they're never frozen, you know, and written on stone tablets, they are living, breathing documents that we try and make better over time. So um, never hesitate to send us your thoughts on, on if we're getting things right or where we might be a bit off track. We've heard a lot today about the challenges in this emotional and complex issue. At its core, this is a policy problem about fear, love, protectiveness, fight or flight. As policymakers, it's our job to manage risk and optimize benefits. But especially with such a sensitive issue, to provide leadership and facilitate good compromise and to strike the right balance between competing and often directly conflicting priorities. Living in community is about thinking with your neighbors in mind. And our hope is that these conversations helped open that door a little further. If you have any ideas or feedback about what you heard today or future episodes, give us an email at communications at squamish.ca and if you want to know more about the animal control bylaw, you can visit squamish.ca slash animal hyphen control. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.